I'm going to be really brief and just um, maybe set the stage for how uh, this project came to be in this partnership. Uh, I met Yona several years ago um, when he was exploring an idea of using design thinking in a community, which is still an idea that we talk quite a bit about and um, immediately was very impressed by what he had accomplished at Tulane University. The 1-8 Foundation um, does not fund Hillel per se, meaning we are not deeply, deeply invested in the campus space, nor do I, uh, nor do we have the knowledge and, and um, depth of understanding of the campus space that many of our other colleagues do. We came to this work because we saw an opportunity to engage a broader set of the population and the foundation really focuses its engagement strategy on those who are less engaged. Um, in many cases, we look to interfaith couples or people from interfaith families um, to, as a proxy for those who are less engaged, although we're really interested in how you help more people kind of connect in a meaningful way. Not that the depth um, isn't important, but we really focus on, on reaching, um, reaching those who um, who are not connected so that we don't lost, lose that thread. And so we were really impressed and came to this uh, because we felt that it was a methodology and an approach that not only was impactful, not only were there results, but actually had the ability to expand and scale on a much greater, um, a much greater level. And so that's how we came to the partnership. And over time, um, have really learned a tremendous amount, most of which, or I should say all of which, Yona um, and Charlie uh, will go through with you. And uh, we're now in the second cohort um, of leaders. And I think that we continue to support the project because we see the impact that it's having. Uh, and we've also learned a tremendous amount about design thinking. We've used design thinking at the foundation in other contexts. We've used it for a local Massachusetts Big Brother Big Sister project. We've used design thinking research around um, interfaith couples and most recently we had engaged IDEO for a, an alumni strategy related to um, an area of funding. So we love um, that design thinking is user-centric and that is the most important piece of it uh, for us that it is user-centric. And, um, and we see a lot of possibilities for it. So we're excited to share that learning. Uh, and then we continue to talk with Yona, not just about this project, but about other applications of ODL um, and design thinking across um, other needs that we have in the community. Anything else, Yona, you want me to cover? Or can I toss it off to you? <coughs> Great, um, can everybody, can you hear me? Can Karen, can you hear me? Cause you're the only person who's actually talking. <laughs> So uh, great! It's wonderful to uh, not see everybody, but I, can, I, I assume everybody's on the on the call. Um, it's an honor to be here, and uh, like uh, you know, as I was introduced, my name is Jonas Schiller. I'm the director at the Hillel here at Tulane. And can you not hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. You speak up. Oh, okay. So uh, as uh, as I was introduced, I'm the director at the Hillel at Tulane. I'm also um, you know, working with the ODL project and other projects around design thinking and around community impact. And I, and I just want to let you all know, just as um, being in the funding space that, um, you know, and I'll, uh, this is in no small part is, um, is Karen and, and Joanne at 1A um, have been a tremendous partners to our project. And what I mean by that is really giving us um, the leeway and giving us the counsel and being invested in the goals of the project as much as we are. And that's been a, a tremendous asset and, and a real sense of, um, it's, it's provided a lot of motivation and, and mobilization around everything we're doing. And you know, I just wanted to give voice to that while Karen's on the phone, I, I very rarely get to shoot, shoot her some props on that. So thank you, Karen, for being here and, and Tamar for the opportunity. So um, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, um, the, the plan is this, I'm gonna speak for about 25 minutes, um, 30 minutes, and then I'm gonna open up for questions. And I'm going to introduce a couple colleagues who are on the call um, as well at that time who can help field some questions that you might have. And if you don't even have questions, we have some excellent questions we have lined up as well. <laughs> so um, we're going to, we're, but we want you to ask questions. I, I really, um, there's a lot of things about this process that I think are interesting and compelling for anybody who's in the Jewish space. So I'd really encourage you to um, 
you know, all questions are, are kosher and they're encouraged. So please, uh, please write them down as we go along and, and, you know, also cheat a little bit. If you have a pressing question, you can put it in the chat box and maybe I'll even interrupt myself and, and take it then. I know tomorrow's probably like, no, it happens at the end, but I'm happy to answer them along the way as well. So um, with that, I'm going to uh, jump right into, I'm gonna share a PowerPoint that I prepared for today that I think will be helpful. Um, and I think this should work. And I'm gonna press uh, start slideshow. And there you go. Can you see that? Everybody, good? Karen looks good. Okay, can you hear me okay? Okay, so um, this is uh, what we're going to talk a little bit about today is using um, this case study. And as, as Karen referred to this, this is really the way I think about this project and the way we all are in the project is it's a process. And it's a process that is, has been applied to Hillel, but it's definitely a process that is applicable in many other ways and in many other spaces um, in the Jewish world and, and, and beyond. Um, so we're going to use this as a case study around Hillel, but we're going to, you're very, you'll very quickly see how you know, um, this quickly sort of um, finds definition and application in other ways and other ways we're, we're thinking about what we're all doing um, in trying to make impact in the Jewish space. So um, the place that we began, and this is really, you know, using language of design thinking, we're going to talk a little bit about design thinking in a second, but in order to like create a solution, you know, for our purposes in the Hillel world, we need to really make sure we understand like what challenge we're designing for. And design thinking is really about you don't design things just for design sake and you're not being innovative just to be innovative. You're, you're designing for solutions to actual challenges. So um, the challenges of Jewish life are, as you all know, are real. Um, there are some big ones like anti-Semitism and Israel, you know, the, you know, how do we manage and wrap our communal head around Israel and all different variations and perspectives. But then there's also some subtle, um, more like um, sort of endemic like, you know, internal to the, how the Jewish world functions, design challenges of Jewish life, Spe specifically at Hillel, but also you'll, I think you'll quickly see that it finds its expression in other places as well. So, um, so one of the things that um, came out of the Pew Report, which we, you know, in 2013, which we, you know, gave everybody a, a little bit of a, you know, a heart attack in the Jewish space, but the reality is um, there's also a silver, a silver lining um, that, that I, like, I think a lot of people overlooked. Um, and for us, it became actually the home base and became the place that we, we gained um, a tremendous amount of confidence and encouragement. And that is, you know, these, you know, combining these two things, you know, Jews are trending away from the Jewish life, um, organized Jewish life faster than, than anybody had anticipated. Goodbye to, you know, synagogues, federations are, you know, relatively down for most part. Even Hillel's, right, participations were like, how do we, how do we get the numbers up? Let's put it this way, the Jewish world community was not thriving. Um, and at the same time, in the same report of Jews under the age of 40 who were saying goodbye to Jewish life, the same demographic also claimed that they were proud to be Jewish. Um, and that's very compelling because if you think about that, if you put those two things together, um, you know, in my mind, in our mind, the way we put it together is if you, if you distill those two things, it's not like, um, you know, the conclusion is, is that if, if the Jews in mass, 94%, which is a, a crazy statistic for any Jewish people to like agree on anything, if they're proud to be Jewish and they're choosing not to get involved in Jewish life, then that is not on them, that's on us, right? The Jewish organized world need to, need to think about how do we reposition ourselves to galvanize all that incredible pride and goodwill that's out there. Putting aside what does proud to be Jewish mean, and maybe it's like, you know, maybe it's very, you know, um, Maybe it's not very robust, but it's something. It's a glimmer. People are willing to say they're proud to be Jewish. So what does that mean? And more importantly, what does it mean for our institutions and our efforts and our initiatives? How can we position ourselves to take advantage of that incredible opportunity? Um, and that's kind of like our mindset going into this project. Um, so what came out of it was a, a basic conclusion, which essentially was told us like, okay, let's build an inclusive, an activated Jewish community or a Jewish um, initiative. And that is that, that means to say that, you know, of the 94% are proud to be Jewish. So that means everybody, right? So it's not like, you know, we're talking about, you know, just one demographic that tends to sort of navigate, uh, tends to gravitate towards Jewish life, but it means a very, very broad spectrum, the broadest spectrum. And then once we sort of like identify that as, as a true 
a true um, demographic of the Jewish space, we want to activate them. We want them to actually take ownership and feel like this is their Jewish space, not that I'm just sort of giving them a product every now and then, hopefully they'll take advantage of it. That would be the ideal. And that became our ideal in terms of thinking about how do we, how do, we do this and what, are, what is the goal and what's the aspiration we're shooting for based on the demographic realities that we're working within. So this is kind of a funny, you know, um, two, two-fold uh, phrase. No problem, right? <laughs> the reality is, right, if you think about it, um, you know, uh, if our market share is telling us we want you know, we want this thing, right? We're proud to be Jewish. So, like, that should be relatively easy, right? Um, and in a certain sense, from a purely intuitive, like, you know, not knowing all of the rest of the, uh, the issues we're dealing with in our world, it shouldn't really be a problem. And, it, and kind of, in a certain sense, it's not a problem. It's a matter of just sort of, like, let's be simple and be straightforward about it and, and, and clear about what we're trying to achieve. On the other hand, um, it's fraught with all sorts of problems. And there's a lot of nuances, there's a lot of subtleties that make a process to make that happen in the Jewish space um, very difficult, which we're going to talk about. So, um, you know, when we think about unpacking our Jewish communal space, this is a process we take through with all the Hillels who get involved in this project. Um, we have to understand, like, the Jewish communal space is, um, has uh, things that work with us and things that work against us. So I'm going to share with you a few pain points just going into this process. For us, it was very um, uh, directive to be aware of as we enter into the space of thinking about how do we make the impact we're looking to make in terms of inclusive for all people. So here's some tensions that I'm going to share with you that we've learned along the way that I think are interesting. You probably, they're probably familiar. Um, you may not have maybe articulated quite like this, but um, it's worth giving voice to. It's sort of like, you know, it's like anything, um, you know, you can't, uh, you know, if you're dealing with emotional stuff and you don't give voice to it, then you're probably never gonna be able to work through it. So I'm giving voice to some of our communal emotional realities, right? So there's a, there's a real thing in the world, uh, in the Jewish world, we have a communal agenda. Israel, Jewish education, Jewish continuity, um, you know, uh, giving back to our communities. Those are things that are very important to us, to our Jewish communal life. And then there's like the Jewish people. <laughs> And the question is like, what's important to them? And it may be that, you know, it might be that Jewish education or Israel or giving back to the Jewish community at this moment may not be important to them. And being able to differentiate those two things and separate them out has been very important because if we're coming only from a communal perspective and our agenda that we bring, we may, be, may find ourselves really out of sorts and out of line with actually what Jewish people are, are thinking about and what, where they are. So that's something we're going to talk a little bit about. Um, that has, goes, goes to, uh, to the, sort of the point of, of design thinking about user centricity. The other thing is obligation versus sort of like, you know, a competitive value proposition. So we um, hope and expect in a certain sense that Jewish people will sort of get involved, whether they feel obligated or responsible or guilty. Um, and the realities are today that um, people in the world, Jewish people included, are not getting involved in anything unless they feel like it's giving value to their life. And that's a very uh, critical point that not always organizationally we're coming from. And as a result of that, we find, we find ourselves sort of at missing the mark of what is valuable to people because we never really asked that question. That's been a very important piece of our process. Um, also, um, when changing uh, anything, um, risk aversion and risk taking are two sides of the, uh, two opposite sides of the pole that um, are worth thinking about and sort of like, um, and naming because we're just not very, we are risk averse in our, in our Jewish community for great reason, right? We're in a communal survival mindset in many ways. We want to make sure that we sustain. We want to make sure that Jews marry Jews, the Jewish people are going to be here tomorrow. We, you know, that comes with a lot of like, you know, I'm not going to be so risky with that proposition. I want to make sure I hold on to that. At the same time, um, great businesses, great growth, aspirational, inspirational ideas usually are sort of pushing the envelope of like what we don't know and what's possible. And embedded in that process is the concept of risk. And so there's a real tension there that we have to be aware of um, in thinking about how do we get to the places of growth and, and, and impact. The other is um, that's very real also that we found is that um, change resistance is um is a real thing <laughs> and it's a it's deeply embedded psychologically in many of our organizations many of our leaders many of our boards um how like the idea of changing is not fun it's not fun just on a, on a human level um uh and certainly not fun on a communal level 
At the same time, the inverse of that is that we have to evolve, right? And if we're evolving and we're growing, hopefully commensurate with the Jewish people who are evolving very quickly, then we have to be in a mindset of being willing to change. And our change resistance, we need to, to the best of our ability, keep in check. So these are some of the things that we came up, up against um, as in our process. And the last thing is sort of going from design thinking, uh, a page of design thinking, user alienation versus empathy. We oftentimes, what we found in our process is that most um, Hillel directors were not always in touch, for example, with the people that they're looking to serve. We know the people who come to our Hillels, we know the people who are on our Hillel boards, we know the people who sign up day one, I want to get involved in Hillel, and the people who are sort of on the outside of that conversation and that process and that institutional um, you know, activity are the people that we often don't know. We don't necessarily even know what they care about. We don't know um, what they're doing, what they're thinking about, what they find valuable, et cetera. And that the yeah, way of, of, of sort of narrowing that, that gap is through this process of, of empathy, which we're gonna talk more about. So um, the Organizational Design Lab was born sort of like out of that, all of that sort of context. And I always start with context because it's very important to know the context because you can't find solutions and you can't identify the opportunities unless you know the context in which you work in. Um, and so the change process of the Organizational Design Lab, which is very much, it very much was a change process. Essentially, we would work with Hillel's and we would ask them the questions. We'd give them the context I just shared with you and say, okay, let, what are the opportunities to have maximum impact on your campus? I.e., who are the students? Where are they? How can we provide value for them? And let's create a solution to, to, um, to achieve that. Um, and that's, you know, on, a, on, a, on a big picture, that's what the Organizational Design Lab um, ODL is looking to do. And so um, before I get into the specifics, also when we started with all the campus we started working with um, as part of this process, the mindset of design thinking was very, very critical. And there, there are a few of them, few of them and that is, um, and these are things that sometimes are at odds with our communal mindsets that we are currently functioning in, is communal, uh, a culture of optimism and possibility. Like we can do anything, we can achieve what we want to achieve. Um, we have to be optimistic, we have to um, be aspirational. And I like to say like, we're, uh, we're not, we're only gonna achieve as far as we're being, as, as far as our aspirations. So if we think it's gonna be like, you know, okay, it'll be okay. <laughs> if it's gonna be like, if it possibly could be amazing, we have a shot at it being amazing. And so thinking about optimism and, and is, is gives way to all sorts of possibilities. And that's something that we've learned that we've had to train all of the Hill of professionals that we work with in that. All in is just sort of another way of saying that um, it's all hands on deck. And so from an organizational perspective, when you're going to create change, everyone has to be involved. It is not just the executive director. Oftentimes, there are oftentimes maybe even sometimes not the, not the most important person. It's the person who's actually on the ground doing the work Everybody has to be involved. Everybody has to be bought in. Everybody has to adopt a mindset of possibility, of optimism, of how we can achieve and what we can achieve together. And organizational honesty is a big piece of the process that we asked of each Hillel participating. And that means essentially is like, you know, we oftentimes know why people come. Um, we people come because we have Shabbat dinner and they find their friends. But then if you think about um, the reality is, you know, most people on, on college campuses don't come. So it's a great question to ask, like, why don't they come? And so it's been very illuminating in our process <clears throat> as we work with Hillel's, we ask that question, why are they not coming? And that's a question that oftentimes people have never really answered for themselves. And sort of asking sort of so for that kind of organizational honesty um, emerges and like, and kind of um, gives like, you know, shines a light on some things that may be uncomfortable. They may not be coming because um, they're not interested in what we're offering. They may not be coming because um, you know, their friends don't come and it's social suicide to come. They may not be coming because uh, you know, um, I have other things that are more compelling on campus. We tend to sort of not try to look at those and shine a light on those things because they don't make us feel good. And the reality is um, you know, if we're gonna make change, we need to be comfortable with things we're not doing well. So that's a very important part of it. And really, you know, as Karen said, user centricity, users are, have to be, at the center of everything. And I'm gonna talk more about that, but if the users, the people who are benefiting, the people who are, um, who are um, the people who are like actually using the service of what we're providing are not the center of our solution, then we're just, you know, we're doing sales, right? And what I mean by that is we're trying to like convince people to come. 
But if the users are actually the people who are informing us of what we need to be providing, that's a totally different mindset. It's a totally different value proposition that we can, we can offer up. Um, holistic is just another way of saying that it has to be across the organization. And so if I'm having a conversation about, you know, what's important to you um, as a student on campus, I need to have the same conversation or be able to tell the, my board member the same exact thing. This is what we're about. We're, we're, we are user centric and it has to find expression in my building. When they walk into my space, they need to feel that on some level that I'm not dictating terms. They need to feel that when I send out a newsletter, they need to feel that when they um, have a conversation with anybody on my staff and they need to feel that when they're talking to other students about what Hillel is. So that sort of sense of consistency has to be, has to be there or it, 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 ebbs, it, it sort of takes away from the process. Quality, the other thing I'm going to say is everything we do is high, high quality because <clears throat> they have the whole world is available to them. And, um, and if we can't compete, we need to compete on a, on a value, on a quality level. And if we can't, then we're done because they're not going to get involved because they're responsible or they feel you know, obligated or they feel guilty. They're only going to do it because it, it offers something to their life. And rigor is something I'm going to emphasize over and over again is that the process and, and going into a process, we have to be rigorous about everything we're doing. Um, details are important and it's, this is not for the faint hearted. It is a rigorous and, um, and disciplined process. And that's sort of, you know, um, some of the values that really informed uh, what we were doing. So um, quick background, Tulane Hill, where this whole thing began, our Hillel, um, uh, basically by applying everything I talked about, working on the context and the knowledge of what we were, what everything I shared with you up till now, we said to ourselves, like, how do we, how do we, how do we change the ship? And um, I'll be honest with you, here are the results. You know, this is like, you know, five, six years. Well, I guess it's eight years. This is the, the stats show here, but the results we saw very quickly. And I'll be honest with you, you know, it was a typical Hillel in 2010. Um, the students who were coming were people who were like what we call Jewish insiders. They were people who, you know, and, and I'm one of them, like I'm a rabbi, right? I'm a Jewish insider. Like God love them. They're good willed, but in many ways they do not represent the broadest demographic of Jews on campus. And so how do we, how do we flip that and how do we uh, engage those folks? And so what ended up happening without making a very long story short, essentially we reached out to um, a new crop of students who typically were not involved. We gave them the value proposition. We asked them, what is valuable to you from a user-centric perspective? How do we create value that's going to be impactful for you? Um, what, is, what is Jewish community? When you say you're proud to be Jewish, what does that mean for you? And, and in doing so, um, we basically repositioned all of our programmatic offerings based around um, not just any students, but the students who are most representative, the broadest demographic, and all of our programmatic sort of menu of options ended up being an expression of who they were, their passion, passions, their interests. We repositioned our staff um, and they became essentially portfolio managers. Um, it sounds crazy, but having um, student leaders um, producing programs, we have two, we have 400, that number 415 uh, students who are now in our leadership cohort. We have a staff of five people. Each one of them has a portfolio of anywhere from, you know, 50 to 70 students. We meet with them individually and customize and sit down and have a conversation with them about not about Hillel, not about what they can do for us, but how can we provide value for them? How can we leverage and galvanize their interests, their passions to create, um, to create something that's going to benefit their peers? Um, and as a result, it sounds crazy, but you know, 93% of the Jewish population we engaged last year um, once a year. Um, and, uh, and the other thing that's the, the underbelly of all of this, which is, I think, very interesting, something that we don't talk enough about the Jewish communal world, there's no way we'd get to that 93% of the Jewish community is engaged if we weren't also engaging for at least 43% this year, this past year was 50% um, of the non-Jewish population. And that's simply because when you go to the Jewish community from a user-centric perspective, you'll quickly find um, most of their friends are not Jewish. Many of their a parent have a parent that's not Jewish. They are fully and, and unapologetically um, integrated and embracing our broad non-Jewish world. And if you want to create Jewish community today, you need to be providing value, not just in a very niche Jewish way, but it has to be broad, it has to be universal, because the Jewish people who are proud to be Jewish, who are looking for access, who are looking for Jewish value in their lives, are never going to come if they leave their friends and the family behind. And so that became a very important piece of, of the value proposition and, um, and all had all sorts of 
um, you know, uh, unintended, beautiful, productive, positive consequences as a result. And last thing I'll just mention, by the way, the operating budget at Hillel tripled, um, meaning the fundraising tripled as a result, because once we started engaging new demographics, donors who never gave to foundations or never gave to uh, Jewish federations or synagogues, all of a sudden were giving to a Jewish organization for many times for the first time. Um, and not to mention the other people who were giving sort of in a reticent way um, up their gift because they saw the impact we're having. So it had all sorts of great benefits. Um, and so we launched this cohort, we asked ourselves, can we do this without, you know, I'll be honest with you, is this about Yona, right? Is this about Yona's like, you know, Yona's deal, and maybe he's just like a special Hillel rabbi, or maybe there's, a, there's something we're onto that actually is transferable, translatable to other campuses that are not in Tulane, not in New Orleans, don't, don't have this particular asset, have different assets, public, private, commuter, uh, regional, et cetera. And that's why this first cohort you'll see is wildly diverse, and that was by design to make sure that we were not just um, a niche program under certain circumstances could be um, helpful and, and impactful. The second cohort we're in the middle of right now, and you see those schools there. Um, and so what we found essentially um, was that we had to go bring each campus through um, a, a process. We helped them internalize this mindset. We help them practice these DT skills, and there are real skills around design thinking around how do we conduct an interview with a student that is from an empathetic place. It's not from a sales place. Hey, you should come to Hello Shabbat, but rather like, who are you? What do you care about? Um, what makes you like? What like? What do you get excited about? And then as a professional, I'm thinking like, okay, what does that mean for me in terms of the value I can provide? How do I design Jewish life, and so I can tap into who they are and what their life looks like. Um, discovering institutional pain points, taking them through that sort of organizational honesty and saying like, okay, we're not doing a good job with this um, and we really need help with that. And we're not reaching these folks at all. These are conversations we found that many Hillel's were not having with themselves. Um, so that became a very critical part of the process to ultimately ideate pot uh, potential solutions. And so it was all solution based, it was all how do we get to the results we're looking for. This is the process we took them through, um, which mirrors a design thinking process, which essentially um, taking you through the four basic steps, discovering insights, who are our users? Going back to what we're talking about, user centricity, who are our users? They will define, dictate, and refine everything that we're about and what we can do to help galvanize Jewish community. And we take those key learnings, and then we did that in the fall semester, it was over a two year process. So each process, each year was split into two, two segments fall, spring, in the spring of the first year, ideation and prototyping. Now that we know who our users are, we conducted anywhere from 50 to 100 interviews on every single campus with students who are hard to reach students who never were coming to their hillos. And it, it yielded all sorts of surprising insights. Um, and it was like a big assumption uh, buster of what we thought students wanted and who, the, who we thought they were and what they actually were. And we developed um, insights that translated to um, ideating and developing design challenges to solve for how do we design something that's going to be relevant and impactful and, rel and, and resonant with who they are. And in the second year, we begin to create platforms for designing platforms for how they can um, create processes to leverage all of their insights to impact the most number of students. And so that had to do with prototyping and institutional integration and communication was a big part of our process. We need to make sure we're communicating um, to everybody, the board, what did we find from our users? Other users, hey, we hear other students saying this. University, students want this. All these, these levels of communication became really critical in terms of getting the, you know, about change resistance, which was real. Bringing people on board, sharing our process, sharing what we know, and making sure nothing is unspoken. Unspoken is non-communicated. <laughs> and we communicate, everything can, everybody like, can get, get on board and, and gain clarity with, with where we're going and, and how we're getting there. And then the last piece is a mindset, essentially evaluation, iteration, and the last piece, pro process of rinse and repeat, it's ongoing. It never stops. We have to continue to discover each year as a new students on campus. Things change. <clears throat> what we found with the second cohort interviews that they did on campus from the first cohort interviews, there's different issues that are emerging. Second cohort, they're finding um, that there's a tremendous amount of career anxiety among students. We didn't find that in the first cohort. Just interested, two years later. So we have to constantly be revisiting our process and design thinking you'll find it is always iterative. It is nonstop, it is, it is an evolving mindset as opposed to um, uh, landing on a solution and sticking to it. 
um, the solution is always evolving as our people. And that's why it's evolving. So um, it was a multi-modal uh, approach we had in this process to take them through that two-year process. We did one-on-ones, we bi-weekly, Charlie Buckholz, who's on the call in in a second. He was, he's a project director. Um, uh, one-on-ones with the leadership, the staff, the team, some compilation of the, of the three. Um, we have monthly webinars going over specific content. Content could range from change resistance, could range from how to, what's an effective communication plan around change. Um, how to have great conversations, how to transition students who are in positions of power to be more um, democratic in how they're thinking about building Jewish communal life. So webinars hit different types of, of content, and then site visits. Going there um, once a semester, twice a year, four times over the course of the whole process, and sitting down with the staff, meeting the administrators, meeting potential partners on campus, meeting student leaders, and jumping into the work with them um, on site became a critical part of the process also. Um, the qu quick results, we, we launched a report, which um, helped precipitate this why we're here today, um, because we were able to share what we're doing. It was, um, it was a two-year pilot, as I just mentioned, and uh, the re results were, were, pretty, um, were pretty impressive. And I, and I say that not really from tuning our own horn. I'm into this work because I'm a Jewish communal professional. I don't want to do this unless I think we can actually fix the Jewish world and it not just be a niche program. The Jewish communal life, I take that, those words very seriously. It should relate to the entire community. And if we can't create relevance and resonance on an institutional organization or any initiative for the broadest demographic, then what are we doing? And um, that was the charge. Um, and what we were very happy to find is that a lot of our work was, um, was, was, was not in vain. And so um, you'll see the numbers are, are pretty, uh, pretty uh, through the roof, essentially. Um, and we basically found that we were getting to a breadth, both in terms of, you know, we're reaching more students on campus than ever before across these campuses. Um, and in addition to that, the, the depth, the, the repeat customers were actually um, was a surprising uh, thing that we didn't know was going to happen. It made sense. Um, intuitively, it makes sense, but it was very, very promising. And this is sort of distilled in, in this statistic here is you'll see the average, you know, average up in terms of breadth across the organization is at like 40%. Um, and I'll be honest with you, from a National Hill perspective, I think last year was about 5%. So we're, we're just doing something that's, that's, that's different. And, and by the way, on that tip, we're, we're beginning to scale and, and work with national. How do, we, how do we scale this more broadly? But the depth is really astounding in terms of people understanding there's real meaning here, there's value here, and we're willing to come back. And the last, the third piece here, which I think is not to be underestimated, I think it's actually the key to our future in many ways, is the diversity and, and, and culture. The culture of our organization, the culture of our initiatives, when people show up, they know they're included. And the reason why we're reaching people we didn't think belonged here, and they, they didn't think they belonged there. And when they show up, they're like, I belong here. And that kind of belonging is how we achieve um, the diversity, which really is the spectrum of who our people are, who are, by the way, wildly diverse. If you go to the GA, you may not get that impression. <laughs> but if you go in the, in the street, right, like Holzing, if you talk to people on campus and, and anywhere in the Jewish world, totally diverse across the spectrum. So that became a very important um, value for us as an organization, as, a, as an initiative. And these were, um, by the way, these are some of the um, unintended consequences of the process that we found that were really interesting. And if you haven't read the report that, that Tamar uh, sent out, it's, it's really a great read just in terms of like, just if you're in the Jewish space and you're thinking about this stuff, we found that the talent retention for all the hellos who participated was, was amazing. And their engagement this was done through a, a, an outside evaluator who came in <coughs> and interviewed all the teams. Um, people were gaining new life, new energy as a result uh, of this process and being a professional and, and just found themselves like with a whole new sense of purpose because, because when you're being user-centric, by the way, it gives you energy as a professional because you're meeting people and they're getting excited and you're getting excited because people get excited when they're, they feel heard and they feel valued. And that gives us, that gives me excitement. And it's true for students on campus, it's true for Jewish people in the community. When I'm invested in what's valuable to them, their energy, their co-creation kicks in, and then I'm not doing sales. I'm, that's organizationally and initiative-wise, that is exhausting. When I'm selling a program, there's nothing more exhausting than that. 
But when I'm co-creating with the people who are benefiting and who are going to be bringing their friends because they believe in it, that's energizing. And that's where I think that talent thing came from. The diversity increase, we talked about that, um, but that had all sorts of um, wonderful um, you know, consequences, new partnerships, new identity of what these organizations were on campus, how people thought of them uh, as well. And, um, and organizational um, strengthening was another great piece of this. Some Hillel saw a tremendous boost in their fundraising. Others saw the university coming to them and saying, how do we um, help leverage what you're doing in other parts of our campus? Or how can we partner with you because you're doing great things? So the organization as a, as a whole became strengthened as a result of this process that we um, captured in the, um, in the evaluation of, of, of what we were uh, engaged in. And I'll, I'll just end with this, you know, again, the pain points are real and um, they're worth thinking about this process. Everything I mentioned to you, I'm sure you're saying like, yeah, that makes sense. Listen to people. And it, is, it does make sense. It's just intuitive, um, but it's difficult because the nuances of our Jewish space, the pressures are real. And these, these tensions that we find, we, we see play out um, over and over again. How we're trained as Jewish professionals makes us think the Jewish communal agenda is more important than what, care, what, we, what the Jewish people care about. Um, we rely and hope that people are going to feel obligated, responsible, and, and need to come, as opposed to throwing confidence and effort into, like, let's make sure we create a competitive value proposition. We... Um, we we align ourselves with more conservative voices who have, who are in our organizational and initiative world because that's less risky. And at the end of the day, and I've had many, many um, experiences with this in my, my career, people care, the one thing people care more about than the mission of the organization, and that's their job. <laughs> people don't want to get fired. And, it's, and it's understandably, like you, gotta, you gotta bring home, like you gotta have a career. And the reality is if we're working in a context where we're risk averse, that becomes our organizational identity. And so that's something that um, we have to own up to and, and think about. And change resistance, just, it's just a, it's a human organizational uh, reality. And if we're gonna grow, if we're gonna be, you know, if we're gonna be in day one thinking as, you know, as like the, the for-profit world thinks about it, every day we have to prove ourselves. If we have to do that, we have to constantly be an evolving mindset. And um, we like to run programs that we like were successful yesterday, but I'm not interested in yesterday. I'm interested in tomorrow and I only can do tomorrow if I know who the people are who are informing what tomorrow looks like and what they care about. And that goes that is user alienation versus versus empathy. It's, it's real. We tend to think we know, um, but um, it's very hard to know for sure and have confidence unless we're going out there and getting to know folks. Um, so you know, uh, when we think about like, you know, funding our, you know, funding the Jewish space and being involved in that conversation moving forward, like how do we invest our, you know, to ensure our future? Like that's the question that all of us are, are thinking about. So I'm going to share with you just a few, a few, one slide just about what this is. And I'll end with this. And that is, I think, you know, from my humble place, I'll, I'll just share with you. And I think that probably Karen would agree with about most of this stuff. You know, I think that whatever we create, whatever we fund, whatever we support, whatever we push, it has to be focused on the user. And unless we're interested in a very niche community, if we are focused on the Jewish people, by definition, we need to know who those people are. And we can't assume to know who they are. And the other piece is that um, I think we need real rigor and discipline around any process that we're funding, any process we're putting out there. Um, and I think you know the rigor and discipline is not just about our process, but like being um, discerning about like what are we trying to achieve? How are we getting there? And are we actually achieving those results? And um, that's something that, you know, that Karen has instilled in, in me and, and it's been part of our process is like, let's be clear about how we're going to measure what we're looking to do. And I'll be honest with you, I'm just, you know, maybe I shouldn't say this, but like, I'm a professional. There's a lot of, you know, number of manipulation going on out there <laughs> between, between people who get money and people, who, you know, and people who give money. And I would just, you know, I would just, uh, my advice to you is like, ask the second and third and fourth question, make sure like, you're getting the right information you're looking for because a lot of people relate to funders um, and initiatives just as another donor. And you don't want that. You want them to make sure they're delivering on what you're investing in and what the outputs you're actually looking for and make sure they're looking for the same outputs. So, um, and then in order to get there, this openness and creativity, I, I think is key. You know, we have to be creative people. We have to be creative in terms of what we're doing. And what I mean by that is not just like, you need to hire a bunch of artists or fund only thing. I mean, people who are willing to 
willing to reconsider and revisit the status quo such that you might need to create something new. And that is an iterative process. It, re it requires a certain openness and it requires a process we can trust in. And you have to trust a process because it's not easy. And like, you know, I'm not interested in like failing for safe failing sake. I'm interested in failing as part of a process that's for succeeding. So failing is good as long as it's part of a process I can trust in. And that's going to be an important part of, I think, a funding relationship. And certainly from a professional, we teach and, and, and sort of like preach this to all the professionals we work with, trust the process because it's not always going to be easy. And so when it gets hard, you got to trust the process. And then the other thing is healthy culture. If we're not having fun and if we're not loving the people we're creating for, um, then it's probably not going to be very good. So it, it, we have to make sure that, um, that whatever culture we create around it, whatever relationships between you know, me and Karen have to have a great relationship because I'm not going to have a great relationship with, with Rachel Rousen, who's at San Francisco Hillel, who's the, you know, the assistant executive director there. Um, unless all of the, 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 the culture that we create around everything we're doing has to be healthy, can't be toxic, has to be like open and, and non-defensive and exciting and galvanizing all the great excitement and energy that's out there and all the possibilities of impact that are in potential. So that's it. <laughs> that's my uh, little presentation. I'm going to uh, end the slideshow. I'll go back to uh, Zooming here. See if I can get back. Very good. Well, thank you so much for, for that presentation. There's so much to, to take in and to digest with that. Um, I want to encourage everybody on the phone to type in their questions at the bottom of your screen. You should have a Q&A. And you can ask Karen and Yona your questions. And I'll start off with a few that we have here already that I think is probably top of mind for many of you on the phone. Is One is, what gave you the resolve and buy-in to move in a new direction? Because, yeah. you know, change is hard. And that's for both Yona and, and Karen. Thank you. Karen, do you, wanna, you, wanna, uh, you want me to do that one? Yeah, you take it. Yeah. So, um, you know, I get that question asked a lot. It's like, you know, you know, people say, oh, you're so courageous. Yeah, yeah. But the reality is what gave us the resolve and, and I think gives all the resolve of all the Hello directors um, that are here. And by the way, I want to introduce on the phone is um, and there and feel free to direct any questions to them as well. Um, Charlie Buckles is on the phone. He is the project director um, of the ODL and he works with all the campuses uh, intimately, as well as um, Rachel Rousen, who is the um, executive assistant director um, at San Francisco Hilla. And um, both of them are, you know, dear colleagues and partners in crime and all of this stuff. And, uh, and they're clearly, they're capable of answering any of these questions as well. In terms of kickstarting the process, I'll tell you that um, what, uh, what gave us the resolve essentially was really that organizational honesty, you know, I, 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 you know, my, I spent my first year here at this Hillel and I looked around and just sort of observed for a year essentially. And then, uh, and then at the end, I just sort of looked at the data. I'm like, okay, this, it's great. We're having, you know, 50 people for Shabbat. That's really nice. And if you go to the Shabbat, it's like, it feels Hamish. It feels nice and it feels warm. But then I'm thinking to myself, Paul's like, aren't there like 2,500 Jewish students at campus? So like when you start looking at the market share, I'm like, we're not, there's no way we're doing a good job. Like, and I don't know if we are like used to that or, so it was more about reflecting some basic data points back to the leadership and saying, I think we can do better, Karen. Yeah, I was gonna, I, I absolutely agree, Yona. Um, and it's mindset for sure. I, I wanna say though, that I think you also underestimate how, not underestimate, are not articulating how important the environment that you're operating is as far as board and uh, board members are concerned and funders, right? Yeah which is, um, it's one of the reasons we focus most of our giving on unrestricted in general, which is a leader needs to be able to lead. A leader needs to have a vision. A leader needs to be able to implement that vision and to try new things. Um, and that means having the, the, res the financial resources to do that and also the control without having a board uh, you know, micromanaging because the board's role is not to run the organization. Uh, and so those are, those are a couple of the things, which means that when you make a tough decision, like upsetting a student, you know, not intentionally, but, but um, refocusing, that your board gives you the, the, the freedom to do that. And I can't underestimate, and I think it's one of the things you learned um, a, a bit in the process, is how important in some cases 
it is to bring the board along and to make sure that you've got that kind of support. Great. Thank you. We have another question that I think there's a, a few different questions that are in this. So one is yeah. like, do you feel this is applicable to other efforts in other spaces? And it goes very well with something that just came in that says, this was awesome. Two questions. Do you know if there is anyone doing this design thinking work well in the day school world, day schools themselves and or consultants? And does the fact that Hillel owns its local Hillel's and integral to the success, meaning is it possible to help organizations and departments that are part of a host organization that may have more entrenched culture? Uh, I can take a little bit of the first and then I would send the second back. There are lots of people that are operating in this space. Upstart um, is doing quite a bit of design thinking. They're doing it for teens. They've done it for, they have consulting. Uh, they're based in San Francisco, but they work nationally. There was, or there is, I can't remember exactly, a day school uh, initiative. I would check with PRISM and see if they know who was were doing some design thinking around that. Um, and I know that there's also a question, many people choose non-Jewish design thinking firms. I mean, I think this is actually the, the ideal model because what Yona and, and Charlie and uh, Trepwise created is something that applies to the Jewish community, but is not, um, but is actually using best practices from outside. So those are some of the people playing in the space. Yeah, great. And I'll, and I'll answer the second question, you know, does, does Hillel own, you know, does it, is it integral? I mean, I think that, you know, the, the, the key piece is that um, there has to be, and this sort of, you know, something Karen alluded to also, there has to be organizational control to be able to do this process well. Um, and, it, and it could be that you're part of a host organization. It doesn't, you know, um, like local Hillel's in a certain sense are not owned by national Hillel. They have a working relationship with them. And that has been, you know, can be very synergetic and, and has been in this process. But it has to be that the local organization, the local Hillel has to be able to own their space and dictate and determine um, their organizational agenda, their process. Um, their outcomes, in many ways, their vision and mission, which I think there's space within the Hillel world for local Hillels to do that. Um, so I think there's a lot of flexibility and a lot of opportunity. I would argue probably most organizations, you know, most federations, even though you're part of JFNA, I think a federation has that capability as well. But it depends on who the leadership is and make sure everybody's on board. And that, you know, that, that can be dicey territory depending on your leadership. <laughs> Okay, thank you. And on that topic of leadership, so how important is having the right leadership with this model? Can it be done without superstars leading the way? And what would be some of the, to add on to that question, some of the key characteristics or ways to, that you would want to look in your, for in your leadership or ways to engage them in, in becoming those superstar leaders? Yeah, Ch Charlie, I don't know if you can hear us, but uh, I want to make sure if you, if you can, great. If you cannot, I'll, I'll take it. But Charlie, I thought you might be able to speak to this idea, you know, what kind of leaders, what, like, do we need a superstar to make this happen? And uh, if not, then what kind of characters are actually needed to make it happen? Yeah, it's a great question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, a little bit, Charlie. Okay. Um, I think that you need to have one, um, one superstar on the team. I mean, we've been surprised. It doesn't have to be the ED. Um, and it doesn't even have to be the AD. It just needs to be someone who's really galvanized by this process. And then the others have to be bought in and they have to be on board. But that's our experience so far. It needs to be someone on the team and it, it can, the, their, their position in the organization uh, can vary. Um, and in terms of leadership qualities, I think Yona, I mean, those mindsets that Yona outlined um, kind of cover cover a lot of it. I think that um, one thing, there, there does need to be a baseline, sort of in the self-honesty concept, but there needs to be a baseline of, of kind of dissatisfaction with the status quo. We mm -hmm. found that to be a really significant. And then, of course, the, the, the mindsets and capacities to organizational capacities to change that. I think the other thing I would point to is like really the ability to um, coordinate a, a, a group effort among the staff team. And that might seem like a basic leadership quality, but the more we uh, find that our, our leaders, and this is an ED because the ED really sets the tone 
of being able to bring everyone on board of this process and kind of empower and invest everyone in it, give everyone a sense of the collective effort. That's been really critical. Thank you. Um, and I have a, another question, pretty light, but you'll see. <laughs> How might a model like this have long-term impact on the Jewish world? And could it contribute to addressing some of the larger community challenges, anti-Semitism, anti engagement with Israel? I know that's a pretty big question, <laughs> but I'd um, hey, love to hear your thoughts. I can take a piece of it. Great. And I, I'll turn it over. I, I, I think it would be really interesting to um, to use this model, not for an organization, but for a community. So what would it mean if you picked a topic, let's say grandparents or couples or what have you, and you found a city that had lots of different players and some non-players, like lots of different institutions and others. And what would it mean if you used a design thinking process, like a real design thinking, don't, not a light design thinking, but a real two year process to understand the cohort and to design as a community around that cohort. To me, we haven't seen it done. It would be fascinating. Um, and I think you could see institutions perhaps shifting. You could see new things coming up, but you would begin to see a community working together, um, both to understand a target population and potentially to have a greater impact. And I think that was really Yona's initial idea when I met him or some form of that. Um, and I would love to see that tested elsewhere, and I think that could have enormous impact. You and I don't know if you have. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I think, I think, I think that's true. In terms of the Israel stuff, you know, I mean, I don't want to open up a Pandora's box because I know Rachel, who's on the call, has dealt with a lot of Israel stuff and also has been involved in this process. But I'll, I'll just say, I'll say one big overarching thing is that I do think that, um, you know, I think that a case could be made that um, you know, anti-Semitism and, and all the, the toxicity of like, you know, Israel has a lot to do with people not actually understanding each other in a, in a deep way, and not having a real um, level of empathy. <clears throat> and I mean, you know, I don't mean being empathetic to people who are anti-Semites. <laughs> I mean people who are like people who are like, you know, who have a concept of who Jewish people are, but probably are not intimately aware of the narrative that we're working from. Not that they need to agree to it. But they, but they don't even have a working like primary knowledge of it, and I think that kind of that kind of thinking um, is true around Israel for sure. Um, and I think a lot of things that are really we're scared of for good reason um, can I think be um, chipped away at by diffusing some of the the hard parameters and borders that we find ourselves between us and them. And I think the more we can we can you know uh, dissolve some of those. Uh, the better. Rachel, I don't know if you want to say anything just big, big overarching around your Israel stuff, but just like as just in that light and that spirit. Yeah, thanks, Yona. Can everyone hear me? Um, I was just going to say that I think particularly when we're dealing with the challenges of the environment um, that we deal with in San Francisco on our campuses around, you know, anti-Zionism um, and anti-Semitism, this is actually the essential piece, this um, user centricity, this type of process that's enabled us to um, engage more students and build those um, empathetic communication channels across pluralistic views within the, our Jewish community that's so diverse that it wouldn't have existed before. And um, back to that piece that Yona said, um, I think that dissatisfaction with the status quo, um, we need to respond to these challenges, they're serious. Um, but if it comes from a place of fear, I don't think we're designing um, really for everyone and, and for the future we want. Great. Thank you. That's an interesting perspective from out of dissatisfaction, but not fear is, is very interesting. Thank you. Um, with our last few minutes here, I just wanted to, to ask the panelists if there's any last thought or two that you wanted to, to share before, before we wrap up. Okay. All right. Well, with that, then I want to to thank you all for for participating and thank all the panelists for the work they do to make change in the Jewish community um, for like, that's my biggest thank you. And then also thank you for coming on today and spending the time preparing and, and speaking with us today, uh, because there's so much here to 
to learn and and apply to a lot of different types of work. And so thank you everybody. And if you if anybody has any questions or wanted more information about about this the different programs and this pilot, you can reach out to me and I can send you I can send you links to all of the, to the report that was referenced earlier if you haven't seen it already. Thank you all. Have a wonderful day and Shana Tova if I don't if I don't see any of you before then. Thank you. Great. Thank you everybody. Take care.